The Douglas TBD Devastator is synonymous with tragedy and obsolescence. It is often dismissed as a slow, clumsy, and badly outdated relic of a bygone era, especially in light of the catastrophic losses it suffered at the Battle of Midway. History, however, has unfairly judged this aircraft. The TBD was in fact a technological pioneer and technically still an advanced torpedo bomber early in the war. The TBD Devastator was the first all-metal low-wing monoplane in U.S. Naval service. It marked a sharp break from the fabric-covered biplanes that had dominated carrier decks. Its stress-skin semi-monocoque fuselage and all-metal cantilever wings was supported by internal spars rather than struts or bracing wires. Measuring 35 feet in length with a 50-foot wingspan and an empty weight of 5,712 pounds, the TBD dwarfed older torpedo bombers like the Ferry Swordfish, whose fabric construction carried severe aerodynamic penalties. The TBD's modern design reduced drag by an estimated 20 to 25 miles per hour at cruise compared to the Swordfish. To maximize efficiency, the TBD featured flush riveting on its wings and fuselage, all-metal bomb bay doors, and stiffened tail surfaces. It used owl-clad aluminum, a corrosion-resistant alloy with a pure aluminum coating that could resist saltwater corrosion. The Devastator's rugged construction better withstood the constant loads of carrier operations, while modular, bolted wing panels allowed faster repairs than the labor-intensive re-rigging of fabric aircraft. In this, the TBD paralleled the Nakajima B5N Kate, which embraced similar all-metal streamlining. However, the TBD's advanced design also revealed new challenges. Its metal structure introduced one of the Navy's first encounters with metal fatigue, which was an unknown issue in fabric aircraft. Far from being obsolete at its debut, the TBD stood at the forefront of carrier aviation. It embodied the transition to all-metal, high-performance designs that would define World War II. It effectively bridged the gap between fragile interwar biplanes and the rugged, efficient torpedo bombers that followed. The inclusion of self-sealing fuel tanks in the Douglas TBD Devastator reflected American design philosophy, which prioritized crew survivability. Entering service in 1937, the TBD was the only frontline torpedo bomber of its era equipped with this feature. Neither the Japanese B-5N Kate nor the British Ferry Swordfish had such protection, leaving them highly vulnerable to enemy fire. The TBD's tanks were lined with rubber that swelled on contact with leaking fuel and sealed small-caliber punctures automatically. This gave Devastator crews a chance of returning home after being hit. By contrast, the Kate's plain aluminum tanks leaked freely and often ignited instantly, while the Swordfish's unprotected tanks could be shredded by even light fire. A single 30 caliber round could potentially disable a Kate by sparking a fire, while a TBD might continue flying with sealed punctures. U.S. engineers accepted the weight penalty, which made the TBD heavier and shortened its range compared to the Kate. Yet they judged a slower, surviving plane preferable to a faster one that burned easily. This philosophy gave crews both a psychological edge and better odds of surviving concentrated anti-aircraft fire during low torpedo runs. The Devastator's adoption of self-sealing tanks set a precedent for all later U.S. Navy aircraft, from the F-4F Wildcat to the TBY Seawolf. By contrast, Japan did not widely adopt self-sealing tanks until mid-war, while British swordfish crews had to endure heavy risks throughout. Thus, the TBD highlighted a critical design divide, which was the U.S. emphasis on survival versus Japan's reliance on speed and range. Its early use of self-sealing tanks demonstrated how advanced the Devastator was at its debut. The TBD was the first U.S. naval aircraft to feature a fully enclosed cockpit for its entire three-man crew. It was a sharp break from the open cockpit norm of the early 1930s. The TBD placed its entire three-man crew under one continuous canopy, which was a major improvement in crew comfort and protection from the elements. Devastator crews were shielded from wind blast, salt spray, and cold at high altitudes. These were luxuries that swordfish crews never enjoyed. This enhanced crew endurance on long missions. The iconic greenhouse canopy not only streamlined the aircraft, they also reduced drag and contributed to higher efficiency and range.
Enclosed canopy improved communication by cutting down on wind and engine noise, which allowed the pilot, navigator, and radio man gunner to communicate more effectively. In contrast, the Kate had separate open cockpits, and the Swordfish's open layout forced crews to rely heavily on shouting or hand signals. The canopy's multi-panel design provided a wide-angle view and enhanced crew situational awareness compared to the limited sightlines of earlier naval torpedo planes. This psychological edge gave U.S. Navy crews a tangible advantage as they arrived over the target less physically exhausted and more prepared for combat. This marked a shift from the fragile open cockpit biplane era to sleek, streamlined carrier aircraft with enclosed canopy. The U.S. Navy never returned to open cockpits for torpedo bombers, while the Kate retained its outdated layout into the end of the war. The Swordfish's successor, the Albacore, had close canopy, but it was considered by some as a failure. The Devastator was a pioneer with its hydraulically powered folding wings and the first operational U.S. Navy aircraft to use such a system. The TBD was the only torpedo bomber from late 1930s with this feature, while both the Japanese B-5N Kate and the British Ferry Swordfish relied on manual systems. A TBD pilot could fold the wings from the cockpit in under a minute, whereas the Kate or Swordfish required several sailors to physically unlatch, push, and lock wings into place. This single pilot operation saved crucial time on crowded decks during mass recovery or emergency deck clearing. The Devastator's wings could be folded nearly five times faster than those of the Kate or Swordfish. The hydraulic mechanism also ensured consistent and precise alignment. It reduced the risk of human error or damage during manual folding. This innovation not only improved deck safety, but also eliminated a significant physical burden on deck crews. At the time of the Devastator's introduction in 1937, no other nation's frontline torpedo bomber fielded a comparable system, and this made the TBD a rare example in carrier technology. The success of the TBD's hydraulic system directly influenced later U.S. carrier aircraft, most notably the TBF Avenger, which refined and standardized hydraulic folding. This provided a strategic operational advantage, as U.S. carriers could cycle more planes per hangar bay more efficiently compared to the adversaries. The Douglas TBD Devastator is often remembered for its catastrophic losses at Midway, yet its failure was not technological but a tactical one. At Midway, TBD squadrons launched without fighter escort and arrived uncoordinated, separated from supporting dive bombers. This left them defenseless against zero fighters and concentrated anti-aircraft fire. Even modern torpedo bombers such as the Grumman TBF Avenger or Consolidated TBY Seawolf would have suffered the same fate in such a situation. The Avenger's higher top speed of 275 miles per hour still fell short of the Zero's 330 miles per hour. Torpedo delivery demanded long, low, straight runs, which was ideal conditions for defending fighters and shipboard guns. The unreliable Mark 13 torpedo compounded the problem. It often ran too deep or failed to detonate, which limited any chance of success even if the American torpedo bombers reached their targets. Thus, Midway's tragedy reflected flawed tactical planning rather than an obsolete aircraft. Ironically, the Devastator's sacrifice proved decisive. Their attack dragged the defending Zeros to low altitude and cleared the way for SBD Dauntless to arrive unopposed. That strike crippled the Japanese carrier force and turned the tide of the entire war. Later engagements confirmed the vulnerability of any torpedo bomber. TBF Avengers at the Battle of Santa Cruz suffered similar losses when committed without adequate coordination or support. Aircraft improvements alone could not overcome the fundamental vulnerability of torpedo doctrine against fast fighters and layered defenses. Midway showed that success relied on timing and coordination more than technology. The TBD Devastator's legacy should be remembered not as an obsolete failure, but as an advanced aircraft whose sacrifice enabled one of history's most decisive victories. Thank you for watching and see you in our next videos.